build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Welcome to our thought for the day. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope. Like wildfire in our very souls Holy Spirit, come invade us now We are your church And we need your power in us Let's go! Good morning and welcome to our service here in Green Island Presbyterian Church And it is a delight to have you with us this morning we are going to consider maybe some of our summer reflections this morning. We're going to consider some stuff around the Olympics because the Olympics, I think, do they close tonight? Still a bunch of medal opportunities available today. Britain hoping to push their way up the table. Britain hoping to beat their record of the last Olympics. Uh, so lots to play for today. In fact, I think as our gathered service draws to a close at about quarter past 12, there's about three events all in the next hour after that which Britain are, are, are taking part in. Um, so we're going to reflect a little bit on some Olympic stuff later on within our service. Um, and generally today there are no outstanding announcements that I know of or things that you kind of need to be given notice of. Um, we'll probably be coming around into the cycle of the next magazine. So if you have anything for the church magazine, please email that across. Uh, that would be great. But outside of that, um, we're in that stage now where we're in the summer where we're starting to prepare for the new season kicking in uh, in September. Certainly continue to read um, uh, some of the materials that we're going to be looking at uh, around discipleship um, uh, by written by John Mark Comer. So we're going to be thinking a little bit about that in the next couple of weeks. But today we're thinking about the Olympics. Um, but you can get distracted by ideas and Olympics and stuff going on and everything else. And so what we want to really remember is that we're drawing our focus back to the presence of God this morning. And so we're going to read from Psalm 47, the Psalm that declares that God is king over all the earth. And so let's hear these words as it leads us into our worship this morning. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the most high, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob who loves us. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with the psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. Well, let us do that now together. Let us sing our praises and our worship before him. the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hand.
reading this morning is a short passage from the book of Hebrews. It's Hebrews chapter 12. I've been away uh, at, a, at a sports camp and I've been focusing on this passage and so it's been in my head a lot during the week. Uh, so I want to read you just these three verses uh, from Hebrews 12 and I suppose it makes sense in the sort of the finishing the Olympic Games that we kind of finish in one of these passages about running the race or endurance or or uh, you know moving forwards so that kind of thing. So Hebrews twelve touches on that. It says this: Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, despising shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Amen. Hopefully God will unpack or, or bring into your heart some of those scriptures. But I wonder this morning, um, have you heard or do you know the name Harry Osborne? Now, the only Harry Osborne I think I can remember is from the uh, first Spider-Man films. But there was someone much earlier called Harry Osborne. He was called the world's greatest athlete. He won gold in both the decathlon and in the high jump, setting world records in both. I wonder if you've heard of William de Hart Hubbard, it's a great name, William de Hart Hubbard. What if you ever heard of him in the pantheon of sports personalities? Well, he was the first black athlete to win Olympic gold. Though, in saying that, he was also excluded from other events because they were for whites only. Maybe you've heard of Harold Abrams. He was a British Jewish sprinter who won gold in the 100 yard dash. 
And he had many battles to be selected, according to some sources, because of his Jewish background. I'm thinking certainly in this week of the Hart Hubbard and Abrams reminds me afresh of the disgusting racism that we are seeing played out in our streets today. The use of a label to reduce somebody's God-given image-bearing humanity that runs in direct opposition to God's spirit-breathed scriptures. What we're seeing is anti-God. What we're seeing is anti-scripture. What we're seeing is nothing but bigotry and racism and hatred. And we must be in no doubt that that's exactly what it is. I'm all for people expressing their concerns about things like immigration. I'm all for people expressing their concerns um, about, you know, mass immigration in towns and cities that change the culture of a place. Um, but I'm, I'm, I find it disgusting uh, that we turn that to vitriol and anger, um, that we make it uh, violent and protest and we make the stranger, the sojourner, uh, the one who has had to leave their own home and travel in horrendous conditions to our country, uh, that we make them unwelcome, that we make them less than, that we act violently towards them. Um, it is all pitiful and it is all disgusting. That's not what we're here to focus on today, though. Um, but it's interesting that two of those kind of significant characters around the year that we're going to look at had to face racism as well. But these three men, Harry Osborne, William DeHart Hubbard and Harold Abrams, they have something in common. I wonder if you know what it is, and maybe if you've never heard of them, how could you know what it is? But it's relevant at the minute because they all competed 100 years ago in the 1924 Paris Olympics. As we have kind of considered sport and summer reflection, it kind of all comes together. We had sport in our in our uh, holiday Bible club um, on the Olympics. Uh, summer reflections, we were in France during the, at the start of the Olympics. Um, it's good maybe this morning to consider this 1924 Olympics because it has become famous and, and, and not just because of the sporting achievements of the likes of Harry Osborne and, and, and others. Really, it has become famous because of one particular man. And that was Eric Little. And a story uh, as it was immortalised in the film Chariots of Fire. The film really focuses around two British athletes. We have Little and Abrams. And their drive and their determination to win the gold medal in the 100 yard dash, which has now become the 100 meters. They get the upgrade to 110 yards, and now it's the 100 meter sprint. The 100 meters was little speciality. He held the world record. And as we're entering into the Paris Olympics, we've got this sort of massive showdown ahead of them. It's between the three best 100 meter runners in the world, little. Abrams and the American Charlie Paddock, who held the, the 100 metre record uh, for nearly 35 years. And many of us know the story. When the schedule came out for the 100 metres heats, it was on a Sunday and Little withdrew. As a Christian, he would not run on a Sunday. He would not compete on a Sunday. And at the time, he was the hero of British athletics. He was the poster boy. Uh, and when he made this decision, he was ridiculed in the British press. Little would compete instead on the 200 metres and the 400 metres. Abrams would go on to win gold in the 100 metres. And competing in the 200 metres and the 400 metres is pretty difficult, but we saw, or, 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 or uh, nigh on impossible, because I don't think we've ever seen anyone win the 200 and the 400. We have seen athletes win the 100 and the 200, and we've seen athletes win the 200 and the 400, but never a, a 100 meter athlete win the 400 meter. It requires a different kind of fitness, a different kind of endurance, as our scriptures allude to today. The new Olympic 100 meter champion, Lyles, uh, he ran on the 4 by 400, uh, and his 400 meter time wouldn't have made, wouldn't have got him into the semi-finals of the 400 meter race. 
So here's the 100 meter world champion wouldn't make the semi-finals for the 400 meters. But here now sits Little lining up for the 400 meters as a 100 meter specialist. Just before the race, an American physio slips him a little piece of paper. On other words from 1 Samuel chapter 2. Whoever honours me, I will honour. Most of us know the story. Little goes on to win the 400 metre gold medal. He broke the Olympic and world record in the process. And he did so holding that little slip of paper with that verse in the Bible in his hand. It's a remarkable story. But then Little's whole life was remarkable. He was extraordinary in many ways. Most people don't remember, but he played international, Scot uh, international rugby for Scotland. He was born in China to missionary parents. He would go back to China to work as a missionary, where he died in a Japanese internment camp from a brain tumor in the Second World War. Having been, having been born and then dying in China, the Chinese always said that Little was the first Chinese gold medalist. Little's story is remarkable. And here we are 100 years after those incredible events. And I wonder what can we learn from him? What can we learn from what drove him? Because I was to ask you, why did Little take part in the 100 meter heats? Or sorry, why did Little not take part in the 100 meter heats? Most folks would say because he wouldn't run on the Sunday. And on one hand, I think, yes, that's right. But on another hand, I think that's also wrong. Because for me, Little didn't run the 100 heats, meter heats because he wouldn't run on the Sunday. He didn't run on the 100 meter heats because of his priorities. He had a single priority that shaped everything that he did. His single priority was that he wanted to please God. And in life, uh, all things come down to seeking to please one of three people or peoples. In life, everything we do comes down to seeking to please ourselves, seeking to please other people, or seeking to please God. One of these things will drive everything that you do. When we pursue career or money or things and stuff, you know, relationships, you know, fame, etc., we are seeking to please ourselves. You want to surround yourself with a life that pleases you, that places you at the center. Or we may seek to please others, and some of this is good because you might want to please your husband or your wife. Uh, you might go into work and you might want to please your boss. Uh, you might want to please your family or your friends, and you focus on what brings them pleasure. Or you may make your priority to strive to please God. You commit your life to following him. You surrender all of your ambitions, dreams, hopes and plans, as the song says. What you raise up as your priority will shape the rest of your life. They may say, I have several priorities, though. One of which is, is to please God. I, I hold my faith alongside my family and my career and other things. But in the truth, that makes no sense. You cannot have priorities. You can only have a priority. And then you have a secondary and a tertiary and da, 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 da. What you might be saying is that many things are important to you, but there can only be one priority. For Eric Little, that was God. And that shaped everything else. Little's priority was to please God. And how that worked itself out, how that expressed itself in his life, was that he lived in obedience to God. So when the scriptures say, maintain the Sabbath as a day of rest and keep it holy, Little sought to obey that command. And because God was his priority, not himself, not his Olympic dream, not the gold medal that he'd been training for for the past four years, that was of secondary importance to him. Pleasing God was his priority and it expressed itself in obedience. And so he did not compete in the 100 meter heats. His obedience to God's word was the outward expression of his prioritizing of God in his life. Now, it's easy to put the cart before the horse. We can come to faith, which is pleasing to God. And then we instantly default to pursuing obedience without ever working out or thinking why. We default to obedience because the Bible tells us that there are lots of things that we should do and lots of things that we shouldn't do. 
And so we get on with doing and not doing, but we never ground ourselves in why we are doing or not doing. And therefore we can easily fall into a gospel of good works. It's all about what I do and all about what I don't do. Look at all the right things I'm doing. Aren't I great? Or we simply, not only can we default into a gospel of good works, but sometimes we just run out of steam. Because we really don't know where the source of our strength comes from. We really don't know much about the Holy Spirit that's working in life because all we're doing is pursuing uh, the do's and the don'ts. And, 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 and the Bible and the church and Christians get accused of that all the time. And so therefore we end up running out of steam because we're serving really from our own strength. Why do we do what we do? That's the question that needs to be asked because we want to please God and God alone. You know, I've always found runners in the Belfast Marathon fascinating, especially those running for someone or a memory of someone. Because the marathon, it's a, it's a, it's a brutal race. And to compete in it, you have to train and you have to train and you have to train and you have to train. It is an endurance race. Much of the training is miserable and the race itself is miserable. Yet when I look at so many of those runners who are running for someone or a memory of someone, I see people who, no matter the misery, I see people who are not going to quit. Their goal is to finish the race for a loved one. And so to that end, they would run the race with endurance. They had a goal and will endure the ups and downs of a marathon journey to fulfill that goal. Their priority was to finish the race and everything worked towards the completion of that goal. Let's consider the likes of priorities and what is our priority, what is our goal, the words of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. For the writer of Hebrews, his priority is to run the race set before him, looking to Jesus. He is going to live his life with Jesus as his focus, with Jesus as his priority, with Jesus as his goal. And that isn't going to be easy. There are lots of things that are going to get in the way, things that will hinder and things that will cling to him, slowing down, trying to trip him up. But he will set those things aside. He will set aside things that are not the priority of looking to Jesus, that are not, that hinder the goal of looking to Jesus. And it talks about sin within there, the, thing, the things that will try and pull us away, will that try to distract us, that will try to draw our eyes away from Jesus. He's going to set those things aside. He will keep the main thing, the main thing, and he will not be distracted. He will not waver from keeping his focus on Jesus Christ. And that makes all the difference. The writer of Jesus, the writer of Hebrews says, look to Jesus for your example in this. The one who, who was put to shame, who had to endure the hostility of sinners. Look to him as your example so that you may not grow weary or faint hearted. So I'm not going to sit here this morning and say, uh, you need to read your Bible more. I'm not going to sit here and say you need to read, you need to pray more. I'm simply going to ask you to think about what is your priority in life? I imagine lots of us have important factors in our lives. But what is the priority? What is the most important thing of all? Is it to please yourself? And I include joy in it. Is it bring joy to yourself? Is it to please others and seek to bring joy to them? Or is it to please God? Because until you know what your goal is, you will never understand what you do and why you do it. And you'll blunder through life uh, just hoping for the best. For the writer of Hebrews, looking to Jesus was his priority. And that enabled him to run the race of life with the hope of eternity before him. Eric Little's 
um, priority was pleasing God, and that shaped what he did. In the case of the 100 meter uh, heats, um, that shaped what he didn't do. He gave shape the whole life, to his whole life, and his calling to be a missionary in China. This may be the biggest question you will ask yourself. The answer is incredibly important. It reminds me of the guy who came to Jesus and said, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, okay, give all your money to the poor and follow me. But the man left sad because he's lot, he had lots of money. It revealed that for him, self was still the greater priority. Another guy sought to follow Jesus. When Jesus said, great, follow me. He said, oh, well, I'll just need to go and uh, bury someone first. And he placed others before Jesus. But Jesus wants us to be like the two parables of the hidden treasures. You know, one guy finds a beautiful pearl and he sells everything to buy that pearl. Another discovers treasure in the field and sells what he has to buy the field. They have both discovered something of greater value than all they have. And so they give everything they have to get it. Jesus is the greatest treasure we can possibly know. Are you going to give up everything for him? Is he your priority? Maybe let's finish with the words of Philippians 3, 8. And I pray you take some time this week to consider what is my priority? Who am I seeking to please with my life? Here are Paul's words. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Amen. And may God open our hearts to consider these things.
bring our service to a close. And as we leave this place, may you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen.